Uh, good evening, gentlemen. I hope, uh, I hope my audio quality is fine. We've got a little different camera set up uh, today. Um, it's higher than usual, so I may sound like I'm at the bottom of a well. But uh, anyway, I guess we'll see. Um, so I think while I'm waiting for parts uh, for that, um, uh, well, for various things, an HX and the Heath Kid and a bunch of stuff, while I'm waiting for parts to get here, I think that we ought to focus on um, getting this old computer VPN uh, going a little better. And um, I worked on that some last night. I've got uh, I've got DNS working. I haven't set up um, any of the actual tunneling protocols per se yet, um, other than port forwards. Um, but uh, I, th I thought perhaps it would uh, behoove us to um, talk about um, the sort of thoughts that I've been having so that you guys can um, share your opinions and tell me where I have stupid ideas that should be changed. So um, the whole idea here um, if you're just now joining the party, is that uh, old computers are cool, and it would be cool to... Oh, pardon me. Ah, mm, sorry if I make some weird noises. I fucked my shoulder up driving sticks the other day, and whenever I yawn, it hurts like a motherfucker. Um, what was I talking about? Right. Um, old computers are cool. Um, and it would be cool to, like, have them on the internet so that we could all play together with our old computers, but unfortunately they are, um, haven't been supported by the vendors for decades, and they're all insecure as fuck, and if we did that, people would be rooting them and then using them to, like, steal people's credit card numbers from, like, regular internet sites, right? And that would suck, um, and nobody wants that. So, oh. Ah, sorry, gotta give me some coffee here. Uh, so the um, solution to that, I think, is to set up a, a virtual private network uh, that we can connect all of our old computers to uh, in various ways uh, that doesn't um, route back to the regular internet. So then even if somebody gets in there and roots your machine, the only thing that they can hurt are other old machines on the VPN, um, which is, you know, still pretty antisocial, but at least, like, it wouldn't be something catastrophic, you know what I'm saying? So, um, the way that I'm doing this right now is with a couple of virtual, oh, virtual private servers, servers. I've got, um, I've got one that I'm calling the Gateway, and, um, it connects to the Internet. And then there is a private network on this other side, and um, it's a uh, it's a slash thirty network. It's only got two IP addresses. The the only reason to have this network here is to connect this gateway machine to this uh, to this thing that we'll call the uh, the routing box, routing machine. All right, and so um, there's no there's no routing per se going on across this gateway. So, to uh, pardon me, um, to connect to this routing machine, we, for example, um, forward port 22 from the internet through to port 22. On the routing machine, all right, and this this gateway machine will have the uh, domain name of retrocomputing.zone. So if you SSH to retrocomputing.zone, um, that on port 22 there, then the gateway machine forwards you through um, to this routing machine. All right, so it's as if you're connecting to this machine inside of this private network right here, alright? And so you get your shell here, but from this routing machine you cannot route, the gateway machine cannot route back onto the internet, and there's no way for users of the VPN, um, well, unless they do something untoward, um, to log into this gateway machine and change that. So everything, everything that this routing machine does is completely isolated um, from the real internet by this gateway machine, and we can forward, you know, Telnet through here, we can for forward OpenVPN through here, um, 
we can oh, excuse me we can forward like um, L2TP through here um, whatever we need to use to get machines that are out here on the internet connected to this virtual network uh, that uh, is routed around by this this routing machine right and so uh, right so this this private network here it's just um, it's just a 10.255.255.0.0 Zero slash thirty network, so that gives us um, just an IP address for this machine and an IP address for this machine, just so they can talk together. Um, but then um, we will uh, uh, we'll have to have a dynamic range a range of dynamic IP addresses for people that connect uh, to this virtual network, and um, we'll put all all of these routing tables, all of these virtual networks. They're all just entirely inside of this machine here, right? Um, they're, they're not like actual like physical or um, real virtual networks in the VPS service or whatever you want to call them. So um, that might make things a little less straightforward to look at the picture, but sorry about that. So anyway, um, so if you're connecting as a user or something, um, ouch, ah, sorry, um, you'll get assigned uh, a dynamic IP address um, in this uh, slash 16 range. This is all experimental range that isn't used on the real internet, so we're good. Um, on this uh, slash 16 network here, this will be for dynamic IPs. Um, so that'll give us uh, 65,000 simultaneous dynamic users, which I think we'll be lucky if we have a dozen people using the fucking thing, so, <laughs> you know, good enough. Oh, ouch. And then we can use, um, we can have another slash 16 network, 10.1.0.0 slash 16. We'll use that for static IPs. And those will be um, the manually assigned static IPs that get assigned uh, to people who want to run servers um, on this uh, old computer VPN um, that will need to have, you know, unchanging IP addresses so that the users that connect dynamically um, can connect to those servers. And we'll, we'll have DNS set up to, um, I'll talk about that here in a minute. And then... <laughs> So that'll give us um, about 65,000 static IPs, um, so that'll be 65,000 uh, servers or subnets um, on the VPN. And uh, of course, um, we've got all of uh, like 10.2.0.0 slash 24, which will be a class C and up. Uh, for subnets. So that'll be uh, 254 machines for, per subnet. So, like, if you've got a vintage computer collection of your own in your own old computer shack, you know, you could connect, um, you could connect like a router of some kind uh, to uh, the network via OpenVPN, right? And then have your own subnet uh, with all of your machines on it, um, or a couple of subnets if you've got more than 254 old computers. But if if you've got that many, I want to come to your house. Um, Right, so, um, that's the, um, that's the network infrastructure, it's very simple, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of routing tables and, um, and dynamic IP address assignment, um, that's pretty standard stuff, uh, I, I think that can all be done with, uh, off-the-shelf software and some custom configuration. Anyhow, so, ah, uh, pardon me. Oh, jeez, I should have taken some of you proven before I started recording. Um, how to connect to the VPN with your particular old computer? Well, um, I, I have enumerated um, several different methods. This is, by no means has to be exhaustive. We can, you know, however we can tunnel through this gateway and get connected to this routing machine some way. Um, will get a machine on, on the network. So if there, if there are any other suggestions, you know, please bring them up. Uh, but for the moment, ouch. Ah, um, 
uh, from, from top to bottom, uh, the most complex uh, but most secure way to connect to this thing would be through uh, OpenVPN, an OpenVPN port forwarded through the gateway to the routing machine. The OpenVPN server would be running on the routing machine, not on the gateway. The gateway will do nothing, nothing other than forward ports through to the routing machine. It's, it's there. It, its only purpose is to keep this thing off of the internet, you know what I'm saying, and everything that's connected to this thing, right? So, um, uh, OpenVPN is suitable for, for reasonably new computers like, say, Windows 2000 and later, for example. Um, it, it uses encryption, and uh, encryption requires a certain amount of CPU power, so, you know, that's just a, that's just a, an unavoidable fact of life. Um, so it, it's not suitable for, for old computers that can't handle that encryption, um, that, that encryption CPU load. So like I say, we forward it through um, on the gateway to the uh, routing machine here. And um, so that's a good choice for connecting a whole subnet of old computers to uh, the VPN um, using like a modern router uh, to do so. Um, because the you know since since that modern that modern router that you're connecting to here with um, handles all of the encryption uh, for all of the machines on your subnet, um, all of the traffic from all of your old like DOS machines and Apple IIs and shit like that, it all gets encrypted uh, as it flows over the real internet. So the man in the middle can't like sniff out your passwords uh, that you're using both on the old computer VPN and on your bank account and then get into your bank account that way because that would be rude and we wouldn't want that to happen um, so right um, the, the, the second tier of uh, connection method to this thing I think um, it would be um, the uh, level 2 tunneling protocol or L2TP that's basically um, a point to a PPP connection encapsulated within UDP packets um, and sent across the internet. Now, um, on its own, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do any authentication or encryption or anything like that. Um, IPsec was generally used when this was a more popular tunneling protocol. It, it predates uh, OpenVPN by a good bit, uh, according to my re recollection. It's like late 90s, early 2000s is when this was used. Um, so, um, but you don't have to use IPsec with it. You can just set up tunnels um, with no authentication or encryption at all. Um, so that's really lightweight CPU-wise, so that would be a good choice for like moderately old stuff like um, old Unix machines and Windows 95 and 98, stuff that doesn't have the, um, the CPU power to handle that heavy-duty encryption, uh, could still connect to the network that way. However, nothing flowing uh, over the internet would be encrypted so you got to remember that and not use passwords that you use anywhere else you know what i'm saying <laughs> just yeah um right so um yeah uh and then the next tier down after that i think would be um ppp over tcp and um you may ask, well, how is that any different than PPP over UDP? Well, TCP is a reliable protocol, and you get into these problems when you try to encapsulate TCP connections inside of other TCP connections where um, the, um, they call it the, the, the Nagel algorithm, when, um, when um, a packet gets lost and it has to resend it, it backs this timer off, and um, when you've got two of those timers going on, with this like double encapsulation TCP within TCP, um, the, the the timers start fucking with each other and they block each other up and you get this 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 TC they call it TCP meltdown um, where your transfer rates like drop to like ridiculously low levels until um, the network reliability goes back up and modern networks are pretty reliable they're a hell of a lot better than what we had to fuck with back in like. 2000, you know what I'm saying, but shit still happens. Um, so it's not a great choice, but um, I think it's a r realistic choice 
um, for old machines that can't do either uh, OpenVPN or LTTP, um, like it's like dial-up style PPP over like a Wi-Fi 232 modem or something like that. So, so, so you could use that with um, with like your ancient Macintoshes and your your old DOS computers and stuff like that. Like machines that have a TCP stack but can't do um, any like VPN protocol of some kind um, that we support uh, would be able to connect that way through your easy to build or off the shelf Wi-Fi 232 modem the same as you would have with like a dial up PPP account like in 1998 you know what I'm saying uh, so uh, that's an option and then finally for the really old computers like your, your, your C64 and your Apple II, um, stuff that has no TCP stack at all, um, also using like Wi-Fi 232 type modems, um, we could uh, dial up to a Unix shell um, hosted on some other machine on the network and just po forward that port um, through the gateway again. Um, so you'd it'd be like dialing up to a multi-user Unix shell in... Uh, in like 1996 or something like that. You'd have your Unix sitting there and you'd do all of your web browsing with links and um, you, all of your text editing with VI or whatever, you know, and you'd download files onto the onto the Unix server and then transfer them to your Apple II or Commodore 64 or whatever using like um, RZ and SC and um, it'd be like it'd be like dial up, a dial-up shell account basically. Uh, so um, that would be a pretty easy way to get connected to a hell of a lot easier than setting up this VPN software, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know. Um, advantages and disadvantages of each and um, some kind of suck, but it's really the only way that you can get really, really old stuff on the network. So I think that, um, I think that providing multiple connection methods like that uh, is kind of key to... Um, getting all of the different sorts of old machines on the network uh, that want to be there. You know what I'm saying? So, um, that's all the different ways we can connect. So let's talk about like, um, like an end user use case. So what would the experience using the service be like uh, for the end user? So um, you'd, uh, you'd get on your regular computer hooked to the regular internet, you'd point your web browser to like Retro Computing Zone or some other top level peer, we'll talk about that later. Um, and there would be some kind of some kind of forum software hosted there. Um, you would create an account there with a username and a password and this forum software would be facing the real internet, both the real internet and the inside of the VPN. So um, the forum software would be there for technical support mostly for people who are trying to get connected to the network um, but haven't yet so they don't have access to all of the information inside of the VPN. Um, things like the how-tos, how to get connected and stuff like that, those would all be on those forums, right? So that's, that's your documentation source, right? So, um, so you sign up there, you supply a username and a password, and that same username and password are your authentication mechanisms when you're connecting uh, to these various connection methods that we talked about before. Like um, that username and password would get replicated over to the Unix shell server that you might be dialing up with with your Apple II, uh, or it would be the um, username and password for your PPP connection uh, for either L2TP or um, uh, PPP over a Wi-Fi 232 modem. TCP, TCP encapsulation like we talked about, <laughs> not good. Um, or uh, somehow we'd roll that into uh, OpenVPN. I need to read some more documents about that. But in any case, so that's how you get connected um, to the network. So um, when you connect then, you would get assigned a dynamic IP address to a single machine that you were connecting with out of this dynamic IP pool. and. That would be the same as dialing up to like an old uh, internet service provider back in the day. You know what I'm saying? You, you dial up, you get connected, you do all your shit, you play around on the network. When you're done, you disconnect, and that IP address gets recycled for the next user that connects. Um, and so 
that way we're not tying up a bunch of static resources um, with people who are just, you know, logging into the network, checking it out, never coming back, not hosting any servers of their own, that kind of thing. Um, we don't have all this shit piling up like uh, subnet allocations and stuff like that that we might eventually run out of. Although if we get that many users, I'll be highly surprised. It would be a pleasant surprise, but um, just in case, you know, it's good to be it's good to be safe um, ahead of time. Uh, I had an outline here and I lost my place. Pardon me for a moment. All right, so. Um, so say you, you do that, you've connected to it, you play around for a while, and you decide, by God, I'm going to run my own server on this thing. I'm going to run yet another BBS or yet another MUD. So uh, what do you go about? how do you go about doing that? Well, you would um, get in touch with someone uh, through that forum software probably, as before, or maybe through like Unix talk on the shell server or whatever. You'd get a hold of somebody, and you'd say, like, bro give me a static IP address, and then somebody would say, cool, and give you a static IP address. And then, you know, you connect, you get your static IP address, you connect using the, any one of those methods that we already talked about, uh, other than the shell server connection, um, and you get assigned that static IP address, and uh, you just stay connected, you run your services on your server, um, you can run your own DNS if you want to, or you could, you know, use the, the DNS that's hosted on this routing machine, um, if you don't want to run your own. Or, well, actually, you couldn't run your own DNS unless you had a subnet, I'm misspeaking. In that case, you'd have to use the DNS that's on this routing machine. Um, but you could also request a subnet, you know, you get your class C, which would be routed through that static IP address that we talked about earlier. Then you could run your own DNS if you wanted to, or you could keep using the DNS on the routing machine, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, that's, that's how you get your ser services on the machine. And as far as the DNS, like um, this routing machine would have a, a fake top-level domain of .rz, i.e. Retro Computing Zone, uh, since the uh, domain of name of this uh, outside gateway is Retro Computing .zone, or at least will be. Um, and so um, your uh, static IP address or um, your subnet address uh, underneath of that top-level domain would be the username that you signed up on that forum software with. So, if you were Jove, uh, your subdomain would be subdomain would be jove.rz. And um, if you had your own subnet, uh, you could name your machines underneath of that subnet anything that you wanted, like fuck you Lee dot jove dot rz. Um, and then you'd have all your shit running on static IPs with domain names and all of the users connecting through their dynamic IPs up here could connect to your services and use them and have lots of fun if if they could find those services. So there isn't really any practical way to make all of this stuff like um, searchable, right? So um, as far as like users being able to find the services, I can't think of any other way to do that than just have a list of services you can connect to maintained somewhere like a web like an HTML page or a gopher site or something in here somewhere <coughs> that everybody knows is the go-to place to see what services there are that you can connect to and that would have to be updated by hand but quite honestly if any of this shit gets big enough that updating this stuff by hand becomes too much of a pain in the ass to deal with then that will be a happy day and we can deal with it then. Um, uh, I'll be greatly surprised if any of this goes anywhere. Which doesn't mean that um, I don't want to put, you know, the proper effort into it and make it make it cool, but um, I'm not expecting... I mean, the, the old computer hobby is pretty small to begin with, right? And this is just a, yet another tiny niche in what is already a tiny niche, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I've misjudged the size of the audience, but I don't know, man. All right. Uh, okay. So, um, 
that covers all of the usual stuff. Um, let's talk about top level peering. So if, if uh, once again, for example, Jove got tired of putting up with my shit and decided that he wanted to run his own old computer VPN, that would be great um, because I intend to make all of the, uh, like all of any custom software that has to be written and all of the configuration and all of that stuff publicly available. So Jove could go s set up his own um, old computer VPN if he wanted to using a similar setup here and then we could peer these uh, these routing machines together through their own tunnels and he could have a different top level domain like he could be dot jove while well, this one is dot rz um, and as long as we had our machines talking our top level machines talking to each other correctly routing between them we'd have to have a gentleman's agreement as to what IP address ranges we were using as long as we had our DNS and our routing tables and shit all set up um, there is no reason that um, you couldn't have, you know, an arbitrary number of uh, top-level peers here connecting an arbitrary number of old, old computer VPNs together, and that would uh, that would make the service a little more distributed, which would be good because, you know, if I get mauled by a bear or something and th this stuff disappears for whatever reason, um, then there would be a place for existing server operators and users uh, to go to, uh, and it wouldn't just, you know disappear into the ether, as so many things are wont to do. Alright, what's the next on the list? Alright, things to think about later. Alright, this deals entirely with IP level tunneling. It, it doesn't do anything with uh, Ethernet level tunneling, and um, I need to do some more research on that, but Ethernet level tunneling, the, the option to use it, would be cool because that would allow us to do things like multiplayer DOS games using IPX networks as well as Apple Talk over Ethernet, uh, both of which are an entirely different protocol than, uh, than IP. Um, and this is it's possible to do this. Uh, I know OpenVPN does this, um, and there are probably some other lighter weight protocols that also do that. Uh, <coughs> but I need to do some more research. Um, and look into that. It is probably a little heavier than IP tunneling, so uh, <coughs> I don't know if it if it starts generating too much traffic inside the routing machine, like um, trying to like route like route all of that Ethernet level shit like over the same virtual networks that we're running the dynamic and static IPs and shit on, or something like that. <coughs> then we may have to make like a number of smaller uh, Ethernet level tunnel networks that can still like route into this stuff via uh, IP but um, themselves are like a lower level like Ethernet tunnel um, and then have some kind of like web page or something that users could go to to, to see who was connected to which of these different Ethernet level tunnels um, so that like um, you could pick the one that was pick one that wasn't being used for your like StarCraft session or something like that, right? Um, I assume we'd still have to have some way to assign like some kind of static connections to those, but we, we can think about that more later. Um, Let's get some of this other stuff working right first before we jump off of that bridge. Uh, what else do we need to think about later? Documentation. Um, for people to get connected to this thing, either as users or as server operators, there will have to be, like, documentation, decent documentation to explaining how to do these things. Um, I hate writing documentation as much as the next guy, but we're going to have to do it at some point um, before we unleash this thing upon the world. And speaking of which, um, personally I feel that initial impressions are everything, like everything. And the thing that makes a um, an old computer VPN like this cool is the user base. So. Um, when we 
eventually unleash this thing on the world to begin with, um, it's going to have to be pretty fucking whiz-bang before it ever goes public. Um, otherwise, people will come and try it and be like, oh, this sucks, and leave. And then it'll just collapse because the user base won't be there to make it fun. You know what I'm saying? There's got to be, it's got to be whiz-bang to begin with so that people have a good first impression. And there has to be somehow continuing engagement with the user base um, to keep people interested. Like we, we, we would have to, we, we, well, we, we wouldn't have to, but we could like sponsor like um, multiplayer vintage gaming events. Like every Saturday somebody could, could run uh, like a, like a multiplayer game of their choice, StarCraft or Blood or a Doom Deathmatch or what the fuck ever, right? Um, and we'd have to have some kind of like social, social connection going on, like uh, something a little more interactive than Unix talk, like uh, like a B like a BBS or something. But it has to be easy to use. Um, you know, we all look at that uh, those old BBSs through through rose colored lenses. But the fact is, they were a real pain in the ass to use uh, compared to like modern bulletin board software, right? So I don't know. Um, these are all things that go beyond the like um, technical implementation, and uh, you know I'm just a dumb hick living in a shack. So uh, I'd really like I'd really like any of your all's opinions, comments, criticisms, death threats, lewd comments, whatever um, about any of this because I don't know what I'm doing. So you guys got to help out keep me on the straight and narrow. All right. Uh, I probably forgot something important, but that's all I can think of for now. So thanks for joining me. I hope we can get this going. Tell me what you think. All right, bye.